Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. I'm your host, Andrew Davidson, based in New York. Now, each year in what has become a hotly anticipated event, Mintel publishes its global consumer trends. These are the big global shifts, not just in consumer attitudes and behaviors, but in culture and innovation that brands need to pay attention to now and in the year ahead. We are going to discuss one of those trends today. That is the trend that Mintel is calling relationship renaissance. Access to technology has led to burnout, and I'm going to quote here, consumers are seeking new forms of intimacy for the sake of their physical and mental health. I'm sure this trend resonates with many listeners, and we will break down what is actually happening and how it is impacting consumers and, importantly, the implications and opportunities for brands. Joining me to discuss, I am delighted to welcome back to the pod, Mintel's Dana Mackey and Jenny Zegler from Chicago. Welcome both. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Well, welcome back. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Dana Mackey. I'm the Director of Trends for the Americas at Mintel. I've been at Mintel. It's my anniversary this month, so start getting your <laughs> gift cards ready. I've been at Mintel for nine years, nine years October. Woo woo. Uh, <laughs> That was my my virtual gift card, sound <laughs> gift card. <laughs> um, I'm Jenny Zegler. I'm a director on the Mintel Food and Drink platform, and I have been with Mintel for 11 years, and I lead our global annual food and drink trends, and I've done that since 2015. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you both back on the pod. Well, let's start at the beginning. How does Mintel develop its trends, and why do we do it? So because it's Mintel... And we're a research agency. Of course, it all starts with data. That's our favorite thing, data and numbers. So what we do is at Mintel, we track seven fundamental consumer motivations. We call this our trend driver framework. I'm going to tell you what these, these seven motivations are. Well-being, experiences, rights, technology, identity, value, and surroundings. We track sentiment across these different motivations using our Mintel global global consumer data set. So it's a data set that we track every six months, over 36 countries, and we monitor sentiment around these motivations. So as we get to the end, really as we get to the middle of one year, (laughs) we start looking back Mm -hmm. at the past two years of this data set to see the things that have changed. Are people feeling differently about their well-being, about advancing technology, about empowerment? And then we kind of have a global, you know, round table. We have a staff of in-house global trends analysts. We get together and we debate what this means for all of our different regions and all of the different categories that we cover. But of course, you can't only look backwards. You also have to make predictions, right? And we want to give people an idea of what's coming next. So we take that historical view and we pair it with our predictions for what the biggest influences will be globally for the next five years. So We're looking at things like the economy, uh, regulatory environment, advancing technology, and we couple that with our data to kind of give us a better idea of what we think is impacting consumers and brands this year and in the coming years. Excellent. So grounded in data and uh, Mm -hmm. layered in with expertise. Well, well, let's talk about relationship renaissance then. I mentioned in the intro that this is about consumers seeking new forms of intimacy, an interesting word there. So what do you mean? Yeah, you you really picked up on that word, Andrew. So I think we are going to get into like the semantics of it because it is interesting. Um, But I wanted to share one of the data points that inspired this trend coming out of the pandemic People have these very broad social groups because we were so connected digitally during the pandemic. But coming out of the pandemic, our data shows that 72% of adults wanted to prioritize their friends, while the remaining 28% wanted to expand their social circles. And that research comes from our report called Americans Social Circles that published last year. So coming out of the pandemic, we weren't really looking to broaden to create more friends, but instead to to deepen, this is the intimacy part, Andrew, to deepen those relationships <laughs> and forge these more intimate connections, even when we do meet other people. And I have kind of a niche example that I'm going to throw out there for you guys to contemplate. So this was covered in the New York Times the beginning of October. They highlighted an event. It's called The Feels. It's like a singles mixer. It's about 50 people that they invite to get together and get to know each other, these are strangers, through eye contact and touch, like hugging and hand holding. So you would sit in a room and hold someone's hands and literally stare at them for several minutes to get to know them better. Now, 
this is very niche. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that this is a new, <laughs> a new form of dating that people are really pursuing, but it's an interesting concept. And it does suggest that people are looking for new ways to interact beyond um, Tinder and beyond the regular kind of small talk that you would engage a stranger with. But how can we get to know people at a little bit of a deeper level? And I think a lot of this is coming from all the self-discovery that we've been embarking upon over the past three years, especially coming of that, out of the pandemic and a lot of people taking a second look at their mental health. Um, a lot of people going into therapy. Therapy speak the way we talk to each other has really evolved mm-hmm. over the past three years where people are talking about holding space for one another. <laughs> and, you know, um, they, the language has evolved to kind of reflect this new emotional interaction that people have. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's also kind of picking apart that idea of intimacy. Um, obviously, that feels a little bit intense, that uh, singles mixer you just discussed. <laughs> but I think it's also finding ways of reconnecting with the people we love, but also maybe finding new connections. So when I went to a dictionary, like an actual printed dictionary, <laughs> um, so it's pretty out of date, uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary has a definition of intimate that includes marked by one warm friendship such as develop that's developed through long association such as your friends um, suggesting informal warmth or privacy like clubs and then of a very personal or private nature and what I think is actually interesting to explore is the other side of the stat that Dana talked about that 28 percent of U.S. adults who want to expand their social circles and so we are seeing a the decline in organized religion and clubs and places where people would meet new people mm-hmm. somewhat naturally in person. And so I think we are looking for ways to reconnect with people, to meet people, to explore. I think maybe the explosion of pickleball might uh, explain some of that too. You know, it's an activity where you're doing that in person and you can't do that virtually. And I think that's an important part of relationship renaissance that people want these deeper in-person connections. I think, uh, Jenny, uh, this is a global audience, so you're going to have to explain Pickleball. <laughs> I still don't, I've never played it. I don't know what it is, but the only way I think of it is that it's just like a giant scale ping pong. Like, aren't That's you, funny. you're on a, you're standing on a tennis court, but it's smaller and then you're just using paddles. I've heard it's really loud. I don't know, but it's sweeping the U.S. That's so it's funny, Jenny, because you said ping pong, but bigger, and I was thinking tennis, but smaller. <laughs> so, <laughs> two perspectives on pickleball from two different points of view. Yeah, no, yeah, Jenny, you make a great point there. I was, um, so I, I, I mentioned I live in New York. I go running by the river here, and I've noticed that the number of people running in groups has mm. been expanding to the point where you get these packs of like 40, 50 people mm-hmm. sort of meeting in the morning and then going running together. And there was actually an article about how this is a sort of uh, new phenomena in New York, these sort of running groups meeting on a regular basis. And then perhaps, you know, that's the 28%. And then perhaps then afterwards going for a coffee or going for a drink or uh, and exploring the intimacy side uh, that we were talking to. I'm glad you mentioned that, Andrew, because that's actually something we talk about when we talk about this trend is how apps like Strava, which is known for it's a fitness tracking app, have moved into the community space. And they're Mm. really kind of redefining their positioning as an app that connects people. So they're moving into run clubs and shared routes and helping people to facilitate those types of of social interactions through activity. Mm. Interesting. Well, yeah, and it's like the blend, the blending of technology to make that happen, which actually kind of leads me to my next question because I initially reading this, I, I thought that, you know, this was really about a backlash to technology that, you know, we'd, in the past, we've developed trends that were really about the backlash to the technology. We talked about it even well before the pandemic and it sounded similar, but is it and, and what's different about it? To me, I think it's making sure that our relationships, especially those that are closest to us, are not only done through technology, especially as we look at people who might be working remotely, making sure that they have some sort of outlet for connections or feel connected to maybe even their work 
uh, colleagues who are all around the world. We still rely on technology to, you know, set up a coffee date with a friend. Maybe we text, maybe we send a calendar invite. Maybe we're FaceTiming someone who's across the country or in another country, but we don't only want to rely on technology. And I feel like that is the learning from the pandemic. We use that during a really tough time when we all should have stayed at home to stay connected. But now we want to get out and we want to um, explore new things and maybe even just do the same things with the people who we love. And so I think it's not only about technology, it's about using that as a reason to get in person. Um, And I think there's some really interesting things, at least what we've seen um, in the U.S. this summer with so many more people traveling or people investing in experiences. I read a a headline last night that the CEO of Best Buy used the term that we're in funflation, that so many people were going and spending money on fun that Best Buy's sales have not done as well because then they're not buying the technology Instead, they were investing in fun. And it really does feel relevant to what we saw. People going to see the Barbie movie, buying Taylor Swift or Beyonce tickets. And those are events that we prepare for. We may have like, you know, figured out the friend group that we're going with there, but we're probably talking to people when we're at the concert. We shouldn't talk during a movie. We know that. But after the movie, connecting and talking to people. And I think that's also a big part of this relationship renaissance, finding those things that we have in common, finding ways to celebrate that, and then maybe even getting in person in these big groups, whether that's in a movie theater or going to a concert, to have this collective experience that we weren't able to have all together in 2020. I'm so glad you said that, Jenny. When you say Barbie and you say Taylor Swift, you just have to know I'm going to butt in at some point <laughs> and add on to that. But I'm, I'm glad you said that about talking in a movie. I could, we have a whole separate podcast around how you're not supposed to talk in a movie, but AMC has changed the rules of theater etiquette for the Taylor Swift Eras Tour movie that's coming out today, October the 13th, um, that you can they want people to sing along, to get um, up and dance. You're not supposed to get wish. on your seat. Uh, this is a PSA. You're not supposed to get on your seat <laughs> and you're not supposed to block the viewing experience for others, but they are, you can tell people are really thirsty for this type of, you know, there's been this fragmentation of the media landscape where nobody is watching the same thing mm-hmm. or listening to the same music yeah. anymore because everything is personalized to your own specific tastes. And so when Jenny and I get on the phone, I'm like, did you see like, no, I didn't see that show. I'm watching this. Andrew's watching yes. Ted Lasso, but I'm watching <laughs> Justified. And so you don't have anything to talk about. Yeah. And so having these tent pole occasions where people can, you know, not all of us went to the concert, but people can go to the movie mm-hmm. and still have this concert like experience that really bring them together, I think is so um, such a great opportunity for especially for movie theaters that are, you know, struggling. Not anymore. Are you going to go? go, Dana? <laughs> You have tickets for tomorrow. Um, oh, you have tickets for tomorrow. You can't, you can't get them anymore, so don't even try. Uh, maybe you can go next weekend, but there's, they were oh. sold out at our local AMC. I wasn't so. planning on it, actually. but the- <laughs> I'm very excited for I'm the Beyonce still- concert movie. Like That's yeah, where December. I'm holding my tickets mm-hmm. for. I want to see yeah. that. <laughs> I'm still thinking about funflation. I, I thought we were past that sort of the era of putting the f- flation on the end of everything from shrinkflation <laughs> to rentflation. I, I, I did a post on LinkedIn about rewardflation. Uh, so now we've got funflation. I guess we, we're still there. I guess the, the Fed's still working on it. Um, all right. So let's, let's drill down. So who specifically is this impacting or where is it impacting the most? So the stat that I brought up earlier about American social circles that's saying 72% want to prioritize their friendships, this is interesting if you pull it apart by age, Mm. because probably, you know, what your intuition would be correct, that younger people still want to expand their social networks, where older people are really more likely to double down on the friendships they've already made, and they want to reinvest in those. So thinking about relationship renaissance, it really does cater to that like millennial audience that maybe is in the middle of their life-ish, you know, getting into their 40s, and they're reassessing the priorities of their friendships. And those are the people that are really looking to reconnect. Well, of course, your Gen Z's, 
they're still embarking, you know, on adulthood and they're at the very early stages of that. So they're still looking to kind of invest in broadening their social networks a little bit. I also see such an exciting opportunity and I think just across markets, the idea of exploring intergenerational connections and like, yeah, that could just be your own family and like making more Mm -hmm. time for your grandparents as well as maybe like your younger cousins or your cousin's kids. But I feel like that really is something that binds relationship renaissance is like, these are the connections that are so important to us, but we lose over time or it's hard to not just text grandma. Um, Grandma's not going to get back to text all the time. Maybe that's not the way she likes to communicate. It's making time. She prefers Snapchat. Face- yep. Yes. Yep. She's on TikTok. <laughs> she's- the fact that she doesn't get back to your text is because she's a virally famous grandma on TikTok. <laughs> But I think it's that like, you know, recognizing that we can all learn from each other, that we don't want to be in these bubbles. We've talked about this for almost 10 years now in terms of consumers finding smaller and smaller, you know, echo chambers to be in. And this trend to me is like, you know, yes, being with the people who you love and you probably share some values or some connection to, but also finding other spheres of influence and um, kind of exploring a little bit more outside of that. Yeah, and there's also like an interesting, uh, you can look at at it through the gender lens as well. One of the examples we point to for this trend is the Budweiser Canada campaign about bringing people together. And they took the Bud out of the name of Budweiser on a limited run of cans and on some of their out-of-home advertising. And they had a survey that showed that as men get older, they're less likely to see their friends in person. And so they were really celebrating male friendships because those seem to be deteriorating as people got older. So there also is, you know, for brands Mm. that are interested in, um, using this approach, I would definitely look at the gender lens as well and think about your audience and who really needs support in facilitating those friendships. Yes, all the different types of relationships that we have um, Mm -hmm. in our lives. Uh, So what about at the industry level? um, How's it playing out there? Which industries should care about this the most, do you think? So I'm going to go back to our trend driver framework. And when we looked at all of the different motivations, this trend really felt to us like a well-being trend. This is a new facet of your both your mental health and your physical health. So really any brand company that plays in a well-being space should be thinking about this trend and how they can um, activate against this trend. So food and bev- beverage, of course, but also beauty and personal care. We already talked about leisure, um, entertainment, but also fitness, tech brands. All of those brands should think about their role in connecting people and maybe how they have a spin on wellness that they haven't even considered approaching in their marketing and communications yet. Part of the reason I'm here is that I feel like food and drink is the natural connection for this trend. (laughs) Like it is like so many occasions around connecting with friends, you know, having a meal with family. It's all about food and drink. And so what I love about this trend is seeing socialization as an extension of our mental and emotional health and recognizing that food and drink is that natural conduit. Asking someone who maybe you met at your run club to go out for a beer to see if you guys could really be friends or, you know, baking cookies to bring to a neighbor who's had a tough time. Like there's so many natural ways of doing this. And I think especially a great opportunity for some brands is to tout their history and their heritage of bringing people Mm -hmm. together. Um, Mintel Trends has a great observation about a short film from India that was highlighting chai or tea shops as the original social network. So a place where it's in all of these different neighborhoods, you go to your local one, maybe it is where you're meeting someone to have, you know, to reconnect, to 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 refresh your connection but it's also where you might you know run into one person in the neighborhood and you guys only see each other at the chai shop so you've got that kind of short connection and I feel like food and drink just has such a huge opportunity to be that conduit to help people strengthen their relationships and even make new ones mm. 
and I guess in the ecosystem of food and drink, you know, so many brands and industries sort of connect into that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are lots of opportunities. All right, so, I mean, you know, we talked about how we develop these trends by looking back, but obviously they're forward thinking. Where is it all heading? Are we still going to be talking about this in a year's time or how, how far out are we looking? Uh, where do you think this uh, trend will go? Well, I think what's important to consider for 2024 is that we're heading into an election year in the U.S., Mm -hmm. and usually that leads to divisions. I also heard something from The Economist that said that half of the world's democracies have elections in 2024. So again, another thing that might lead to some 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 issues among people in your lives potentially yeah. um but what i really love about this trend is the prediction for that next period so the next 18 months to two years that individuals don't just want to be cared for they want to care for others so i see this as a great way of for brands across categories to really help people show the care that they have for the people in their lives, especially these strong relationships that they want to make sure stay strong. So just making sure to keep in touch, um, you know, just even if it's a special occasion or just to say, I'm, I'm thinking of you. Um, one of the things, another great Mintel Trends op- observation is from a, the greeting card company American Greetings, and they've added this subscription service called Picks and Wishes. And you're able to sign up for this and you can create personalized greetings. So you are you know, adding your own videos, you're adding some photos. You can also send this any of these greetings via text or email or social media. Um, but my favorite thing about this is that you can pre-schedule the greetings. So let's say you are someone who maybe forgot someone's birthday or an anniversary at some point and you don't want to mess that up because you are really dedicated to your relationships. <laughs> and so you spend, you know, 30 minutes on a lazy Sunday and you make these amazing greetings and you schedule them all out and you're probably going to surprise yourself when you get a thank you message maybe from someone um, that that's already gone out. But I really think it's that nourishing and strengthening of a relationship that will have really long term connections connections with this trend. I already mentioned that my Mintel anniversary is coming up this month. I think it's the 20th. So um, start scheduling your cards to go out to me um, to celebrate. But, but the other thing that I think is really around the corner for this trend is brands really embracing touch. And yes, that is a pun that I intended and I've used several times. Now, I know this is an audio medium, but I brought some props to share with you to explain what I mean. Here's my first prop. For those listening, this is a Pikachu Squishmallow. It's a big, squishy, stuffy, but I have some other squeezable toys. This is a Sanrio Surprises little squishy toy. This is another one. These all came out of my son's room. Look at this one. (laughs) So what I mean is like, these are all, all kids' toys, but they really focus on touch. They're squishy. They're tactile. They're soft. You want to squeeze them because I do think part of the reason that, again, these intimate connections, the friends that you would hug... You can't get that on a digital, you know, chat, a a video chat or a FaceTime or a text. And so brands can really cater to an audience of individuals who are missing out on that tactile experience and want to touch something. And so you're seeing all of these. There are like fidget toys, but also these just really tactile um, products that people are literally embracing because they're missing out on some of that intimacy with their friendships. So I do think that's an, when we think about brands using sensory marketing, I think that's one that is missing from a lot of brands. They're not thinking about it. And it is something that they can incorporate into their product development or into their um, their pipeline to think about mm. how can their products be um, feel better when you, when you grab them, when you touch them. <laughs> make them. Make them squishy, make them slimy. <laughs> I mean, it's about, yeah, that's great. I mean, and both of what both of both of what you were saying that actually reminds me there was um, an announcement in August from Venmo. They partnered with Hallmark, um, so now you know you might be sending if you hadn't scheduled and you were going to send your gift via Venmo. Now they've got this partnership with Hallmark, so you can actually send a physical card in the mail, and then you can scan the QR. You know, then the recipient can scan the QR code. So I think that sounds like it fits quite nicely with what we've been talking about here in terms of blending that 
sort of physical and um, uh, and digital. Um, all right, great. So, um, what are the challenges then, and the opportunities that Relationship Renaissance presents for brands? I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but maybe you could each speak to one challenge and one opportunity that listeners could, you know, really take away as an sort of action item. So I have a little bit of a counterintuitive opportunity, and this came to me in a conversation that I was having with a client, and she was saying that this trend isn't just about deepening relationships that are personal, but it's also about maybe curating or culling some of the relationships that you, you know, you maybe spent the pandemic really reaching out on LinkedIn or on social media. And now you want to kind of narrow your um, social circle to the people that are actually meaningful to your life. I listened to an interview with the author Chuck Klosterman when his book, The 90s, I know you do, when his book, The 90s came out, which both of us own, but only one of us has read. And it was Jenny. (laughs) But he was, he was, the book is about the 90s. And he's, he's talking about how generations have changed based on their interactions with the internet. And what he was saying was in a pre-internet age, which which all of us here in this conversation will remember, the focus was on broadening your information base. You were really seeking Mm -hmm. knowledge. You were trying to get more information because you didn't have everything at your fingertips. And then post-internet, it's the opposite. It's about narrowing all of that information into something that's useful and helpful because you have literally the all of the information available to you anytime you want it. And so I do think that really applies to social networks as well. We spent so much time broadening them and, and connecting and making friends and reaching out. And now we have these huge unwieldy social networks on our social platforms that we can't do anything with. So we've seen a lot of tactics for social media networks like um close friends where you can narrow the list of people that you're actually sending your post out to the app lock it where you're just using a closed circle of people and sending photos right to their phones the app catch up which uses your contact list to help remind you to keep in touch with people but i do think that's an area where brands can really tap into um helping people reprioritize in terms of challenges Mm -hmm. this is kind of a challenging one because It takes work on the consumer end to connect with other people and brands can do the nudging and can do the recommending. um, But it really is hard to uh, connect with other people in person and we're out of practice. Mm -hmm. So what brands can do to overcome this is give some, give people something to connect over, give them an event to go to, like you were saying about Barbie movie and Taylor Swift concert. But I do think it also works for CPG categories Um, We talk a lot about changing self-care to connected care. So thinking about BPC, so the beauty and personal care categories. How can all of those self-care rituals that you came up with maybe during the pandemic to take care of yourself, how can you do those things with other people? Face masks Mm. and, um, you know, hair treatments or nail treatments, all of those slumber party essentials. (laughs) How can we get back to um, a format where you're doing those with other people and you're creating Again, this is like a, a vulnerable, intimate space. You're taking care of yourself with another person. But yeah. it's an interesting um, you know, facet that you could explore. I like the idea that you explored reprioritizing people without blatantly saying cutting people out of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Unfollow. <laughs> oh, I've gotten text message where I just want to just like <laughs> reply, unsubscribe. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you are connected to this person. You are friends with them. You can't say that. Um, from my end one of the challenges I think is the current economy so how can you bring people together and help them nurture their relationships with ways that don't require spending a lot of money Um, again this is where I think food and drink fits really well you can share a coffee with someone you know Mm -hmm. Um, and I think brands will have to find that balance as we saw with now if we want to call it funflation people want that experiences they're willing to spend money on these big things but it could just be that you really miss your best friend and you haven't had some quality time so you're going to grab some face masks and you're going to sit around and you know just enjoy each other's time um not face masks like the covid face masks the beauty ma- face masks <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's um cl- important to clarify 
And actually, we see this. So our brand new Brazilian lifestyles report um, finds that 36% of Brazilians would like to keep socializing more at home to save money. So this, I think, is something that can we provide some inspiration for that. Um, on the other hand, on that opportunity side for relationship mm -hmm. renaissance, I think there's so much potential for creative ways that people can use to make their friends, family, and other close connections feel special. Like we all get so bogged down in the busyness of our schedules, of our day-to-day -day lives, and that out of the blue, even if it is just a text, can feel so great. Um, and I feel like I, I flash back to my one of my elementary school teachers who had this box in the classroom um, with little pieces of colored paper that she called warm fuzzies. And anytime that you just wanted a shout out of gratitude or you wanted to say you like someone's sweater, but you didn't want to say it, if you wanted to show some, um, you know, good thoughts, you would put a little note in that warm fuzzies box. And I feel like, as Dana said, sometimes we've lost a little bit of our social skills and it takes that little bit of reminder reminding and I think as much as it would be great to spend a whole slumber party weekend with your best friends it also could feel just as equally intimate to be sending them a message of like I really enjoyed you know this or your hair looks great today like there's just those little small things that can over time really build into a strong relationship. Excellent. Well, those are great um, actionable uh, chat opportunities and challenges for our listeners to think about. Uh, Dana, how can listeners get access to Mintel's global consumer trends? So the great thing about the trends is that we have a selection of content that is available to everyone. Um, you don't have to be a Mintel subscriber. And then we have deeper content for our clients. So if you go to Mintel.com, you can download a summary of these trends and kind of understand all five of our consumer trends and all three, three or four, Jenny, of our four <laughs> food and beverage trends. And then for clients, if you go to clients.mintel.com, you can go into your client portal and you can see the deep dive into all of these trends and see some of the data behind them. Click through, explore, find out what it means for your audience through the demographics. Um, but a lot of information is available for these and for our beauty and personal care trends as well. So check those out too. Excellent. Well, I've, I've really I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Three big sort of takeaways from me. I mean, ultimately, it's about wellness this trend i think that's what i've learned mm -hmm. from our, our conversation today and that you know it's all about it kind of underscores the importance of relationships and relationships is what we as human beings value the most um and it's all about getting relationships right and so it's a very uh, obviously deep and important topic i think the other thing you know take away from me is this this isn't about a backlash to a backlash to technology you know it's about using technology to mm -hmm. in, in a better way to sort of achieve that um, and then I guess number three, from a brand perspective, I think you both spoke to the idea that this is a sensitive area. You know, this is challenging. It's sensitive. Um, obviously, brands need to tread carefully, create space, um, not rush in, be authentic, um, because, you know, this is uh, meaningful stuff uh, for, for, for everybody. So, all right. Well, thank you, Dana and Jenny. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. The conversation doesn't end here. Head over to Mintel's LinkedIn and Instagram and let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your thoughts. If you want to know more about Mintel, visit Mintel.com and sign up to become a member of the free Mintel Spotlight community. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Goodbye for now and we'll catch you next time for a new episode of Little Conversation. Little Conversation.